So my objectives for today's session, um, what I'd like to do is really highlight some of the opportunities for us here. And what I found in Australia was that most people were coming away from the session going, actually, you've told me something about Azir I didn't know, or you've given me an idea about how we could use Azir that we hadn't really thought of. Um, you know, it was quite cool, even one guy in Australia even went on to write a white paper about using BizTalk in Azir off the back of what he'd seen in, in this session and a few of the others down in Australia. So that, that was a real nice, nice compliment. But um, I think it's important to share real world experience as well. So rather than showing any demos today, what I'd like to do is talk about architecture and talk about real world things. And in this session, everything you see will either be something we really did and went into production or something we prototyped and explored how we might do it. So I'm hoping to give you guys some good thinking about that. And predominantly, it's all going to be about hybrid connectivity. So the agenda is in three bits. Um, I'm going to try and rush through it a little bit in parts just so we can not be too much of the break. But the first bit's about the hybrid challenge and why this problem domain is important. The next bit will be about the technology options that are available. And then I'm going to going to close off with just, just some of my thoughts about what, what that means and what, what you might want to think about. And th this is a slide. We, we did an event in the UK called the Hybrid Enterprise um, last year. And this was a slide that I had at that event where it was really talking about this idea that, you know, traditionally customers were all about their own data center. Everything was on premise. But we've got new things in the cloud that, you know, people are starting to think about and having to work with. So that might be partners, you know, partners that you could argue is a thing that might have been there for a while, but we've got these new things like cloud platforms we're integrating with. People are starting to think about devices and things, and also SaaS applications, which is, you know, that's definitely one of the bigger areas. And that's really about how the enterprise has changed to bring this problem space to us. And whenever you, you know, I kind of have a bit of a bugbear about diagrams like this. So you see a lot of this kind of conceptual diagram where we've got on-premise some applications and some integration. And we've got some stuff in the cloud, which is integration and applications and stuff outside the organization. And then the, um, in my slides in, in Australia, that arrow in the middle was actually a blue arrow. And what I used to say is like, whenever I see this diagram, I always see this big blue arrow or pipe in the middle between on-premise and the cloud. But nobody really elaborates on what that actually is and how it should work. It's just assumed to be this magic, magic thing that just makes it work. But... I want to kind of demystify that a little bit in this session today. So in, in Azure, in the Microsoft space, we've got um, seven technology choices that I believe can help you achieve this objective of creating connectivity between the cloud and your on-premise data center. And I've grouped them into three areas. So we've got some networking technologies. And I'm going to talk a little bit about express route, site-to-site -site VPN, point-to-site VPN. We've got two main areas in service bus. So we've got the messaging and queues area, and we've got relayed messaging. And then we've also got BizTalk services. So we've got hybrid connections and the BizTalk adapter service. And what I've found is that most people have heard of a few of them. Some people have never heard of certain ones, and some people aren't really sure what they are and where they fit. So I'm going to do a bit of a lap around these technologies and just give you guys some example projects where we, where we try to leverage these. So first up, we've got ExpressRoute. And ExpressRoute's been out for a little while now, but it's probably one of the ones that people might not be that familiar with. And ExpressRoute's a networking technology. And the idea is that we'll, um, we'll kind of extend your MPLS network and connect Azure as another data center on that network. And the target scenarios are really about shifting large amounts of data or really good, um, good latency and bandwidth between your data centers. And there's some good benefits that you can get for that. So if you're doing like high performance applications or you have concerns about security, then ExpressRoute can be a good choice because with ExpressRoute, you're going over a private connection, whereas you know, tr traditional VPN technology uses the public internet connection. And ExpressRoute's one of these new, new network technologies that are available. And when we, when we looked at this, so one of the companies I worked with was actually one of the first adopters in the UK of Express Route when it rolled out there. And you know, we, we got involved in this kind of TAP program and, and the onboarding side of that. And a couple of things that you know it was really cool, but a couple of things I'd just point out is that 
potentially can be quite expensive. You know, it really just depends on how big the bandwidth you need and you know, what, what your network providers are like. But also, you need to engage with a network provider as well. So in the UK, we had to engage with BT. And it's not, it's not really in the space where with Azure, often you used to just go to the portal and click a couple of clicks or a bit of PowerShell and you've set something up. There's a much bigger kind of engagement piece with, um, with ExpressRoute. So just to give you a couple of examples of, of wh where we thought about this and where we were going to use it. So if we had, the idea was we've got our data center in Denmark, we've got one in the UK and one in Miami, and they're all connected on this big WAN, which is based on MPLS, and effectively Azure becomes another site on that network, and it just really looks the same as connecting to any of our other networks. And a couple of examples of you know, taking it a bit deeper is if you've got your on-prem network, you might have some AD in there, a few different types of servers. And one of the examples might be, well, we'll, we'll now extend to Azure and try and create this, this kind of extended data center model. And we might put a read-only copy of AD out in Azure, you know, give us some better performance, but then we can start shifting some of our servers out into the cloud and just make it look like one big network. And you know, that, that's quite a good use case for ExpressRoute. The next sample project was, um, we had a, a sort of business intelligence project, which it was, you know, I'm, I'm not a BI guy, I'm an integration guy, but actually I quite like this project um, from an architecture perspective. And the idea was um, we had data in different, in different businesses around the world and um, we wanted to kind of pull them together and, and do some interesting um, reporting and stuff around that. And Azure was a great way, to, you know, because it was kind of like a prototype project to see what we could do. So spinning stuff up in Azure was a good way because we can, you know, do this fail fast type thing where if, it, if we find it doesn't work or for whatever reason we want to kill the project, it doesn't require us to make a big upfront investment. But once we had ExpressRoute in place, you know, this idea of um, using something like SSIS to go and pull bulk data in from different, you know, different regions, get it into our big meaty SQL server in Azure, and then we could do some Power BI and Office 365 reporting on it. And you know, with, with things like um, Azure, we had the opp opportunity to maybe use the SQL data warehouse, but we could also use things like table storage as well, which, um, which can be a source for your Power BI report. So we had loads of opportunities there on Azure, and, and we were actually able to get um, get something up and running as a prototype in, in a really quick time just to you know, show the business some value from that type of solution. So the next one is point to site VPN. And point to site VPN, if I had to chop the presentation down a little bit more, this would be the one I would have chopped out because it's not quite as cool to integration guys, but it is, it is an option that kind of fits in this space of how do I connect on-premise to the cloud or vice versa. And point to site VPN is really about remote desktop. So if I'm, if I'm sitting in a company, I want a remote desktop to an Azure VM. If it's not connected to my network, sometimes you get problems where your network guys might restrict the, the ports you can open up and you might not be able to get to that VM. And you know, point to site VPN kind of lets you work around that. And in Azure, you would download the um, VPN client, you'd install it, and then you kind of tunnel over SSTP, which is often, you know, kind of goes over um, ports that are open on the firewall, and you should be able to get out to your um, to your VM. The, the kind of only real constraint on that is that, um, apart from installing the VPN client, you need your VM to be part of a virtual network in Azure. But if you're in that space, then you've got a pretty good option here. And the, one of the reasons I kind of kept this kind of kept this one in is I think. As BizTalk customers, I think that the project we talked about here was one of the ones I would say you really should look at what we did because it was pretty cool. So even if you're a company where you're quite resistant of cloud and you, you, know, you would never maybe put your production stuff up there, one of the things we did was we had some BizTalk dev environments in Azure and we could create a, a virtual network up there. We could create some build servers. We could create some dev machines. And, and the big problem with BizTalk dev that I find many customers I speak to is um, we, we're always like, you know, kind of, um, you know, we're never really given the kit we need. You know, if you want to get a build server, it's often really painful. Nobody will pay for it. And they don't, you know, often, you know, I, even your IT department, but definitely the business don't see the value of stuff like that. 
So they'll go, well, it costs, you know, a thousand pound. No, you're not having it. So putting it up in Azure meant we can do things like spin up our dev environment when we need it, turn it off when we don't. And it also meant because we had a geo distributed team, we could have guys in India, Romania, the US and the UK all kind of working together in the cloud. And, and obviously we used Visual Studio Online. And you know, the, the reason I say that's a good choice for, for biz talk teams is um, for two things. Number one, we were running a team with 20 developers and the running costs on our enterprise agreement were like, you know, I think we were paying 20 pound a day when we used it and about a pound a day when we didn't. So that, that's a no-brainer to me um, about why it's a good, a good choice to consider. But also, a lot of you guys are probably thinking about migration projects at some point. And you know, having, if you think of what I've said about how difficult it is for on-premise dev environments, if I throw a, an, up, an, an upgrade project in the mix, suddenly you need to support your BizTalk 2009 environment, but also a 2013 environment. So suddenly you've got twice as much um, physical kit on premise that you need and, and it's just difficult to do that so in Azure you can just have two completely different labs running two different versions of BizTalk and use what you need don't pay for it when you're not using it it's, you know it's a great one but the coming back to the point of site VPN so the challenge we had was um, the <laughs> all around the world everybody was easily able to get into this um, the, these VMs except in the UK where it was really painful because our network guys locked the network down so we, we couldn't get to them. So we, we basically just installed point of sight VPN on our machines in the UK and suddenly we can, we can play in this game as well, but the other guys could just access them over the internet. The next one's um, site to site VPN. So this, this one's very similar to Express Route, except you know, it's all about connecting our network in the cloud with our network on premise so the servers can talk to each other. And the big difference with Express Route is it's a bit cheaper. It's you know, probably something that your uh, network guys are more familiar with. And in the Australia presentation, the bit I've chopped out, I talked a lot about the different people you'll come across in, in projects where you start using cloud and what, they're, what the common expectations and the common challenges that you would come up with. And we haven't really got that in today, but the, you know, the big one is that your IT pro guys, they really understand VPN and they're usually really comfortable doing that. But you know, with it, the sacrifice, if you use this one, it's not going to be as fast, and it's not going to have the bandwidth that um, ExpressRoute would have. But the, the trade-off is it's going to be a lot cheaper. Conceptually, though, it's, it's basically the same. You're connecting those two networks. And you know, an example project where we played around with this before we had ExpressRoute was we could have our on-premise um, data center again, and we spin up our Azure network, and suddenly we can just lift and shift uh, VMs as we need to into the cloud and you know some some VMs are great targets to put in as here so things like web servers things like that biz talk maybe maybe a good target maybe not so good depending on what your um, high availability requirements are okay so th those are the the networking ones out of the way um, the next one's called service bus relay and I think a lot of the times you know that this has been around for years you know it was one of the first things to come out on, on Azure, if I remember correctly. And I find some, some people have used it, some people have still never really heard of it. And a lot of companies, they don't really get what it does. So the, the easiest way I found to explain this is people are familiar with web services on premise and people are familiar with sticking a hardware load balancer in front of them. Now imagine that I took your hardware load balancer and just shoved it up in the cloud and kind of hid it away from you. And you can then sort of have that, have that kind of load balance and virtualization in the cloud to those web servers. If, if you kind of explain it like that, people understand what you're saying. But then you can go down into the lower level bit where you say, well, you know, there's a, a bit on premise, it opens up an outbound connection, and suddenly you've got a listener waiting for web service calls. There's, there's the kind of the physical implementation of that. Now, target scenarios for Service Bus Relay, it's really... Here's a quick and easy way to get your services if they're WCF arrest based, exposed outside of your organization. That, that's, the, you know, that's the key kind of, kind of use case for this. And in most cases, it's going to be very simple and very, uh, very low cost to do that. And you know, that, that's kind of why it was one of the first technologies we looked at. But there's, there's a couple of constraints that come with this as well. And the first one's that you can only really use the WCF bindings with it. You can still do REST, you can do SOAP, but you, you've got some restrictions about, about things a little bit. Um, 
I'd also argue that the management monitoring story around Relay is kind of not that great. You know, there's the stuff there, but, you know, it, it's not fantastic. There's, there's other products in, in Azure which have much deeper, richer monitoring stuff. And just to, to give you guys an example of um, where we use this, th this was one of my favorite projects, and this was all about why lightweight, agile integrations, kind of the thing that businesses are interested in these days. So we... Um, if you imagine we, we did a little bit of work in the UK and were really successful and our, our business in Denmark sort of heard about this and they said well we've got this project where we've got a you know we've got this um, data center in Denmark and we've got WebSphere we've had it for years we've integrated all of our stuff but the problem is there's an application being developed that's hosted outside of our data center and we're not really sure how to connect this stuff up and we've heard about the good stuff you've done can you tell us more? Can you show us what you can do? And, you know, traditionally people would go and connect VPNs and, you know, kind of route this stuff through. But they, they were just interested, what are the other options that are available? And, you know, some people have issues with VPNs as well. And, you know, they, from you know, network guys love them, but it's very easy to end up with a lot of cost involved, it takes a long time to set up. And, you know, there's debates about how secure or not secure they are. So we, um, we went out to Denmark in December and we, we had this challenge of can we do hybrid integration in one day? And these guys in Denmark had never, they knew nothing about Azure. They were a pretty good Microsoft um, dev team, but they'd never touched Azure before. And the challenge was, well, let's go out in the morning, we'll do a whiteboard session, tell them what we're gonna do, and by the end of the day, we want something to show them. So what we did was um, we basically put Service Bus Relay in the cloud, we hosted in Amsterdam, you know, that, that's up and running in a few clicks, so we're, we're looking good so far. And on WebSphere, we, we knew that the guys had exposed some SOAP services already, so we, we knew we could potentially hook into them. So what we did was we said, well, let's, let's get the WCF routing service. We'll host that in IIS in the Danish um, data center, and we can just use WCF to connect that straight up to the relay. And we just forwarded the messages onto WebSphere. And we didn't write a single line of code here. That, that's pretty cool as well, you know, no code, it was just config. And once this is all joined up, by the end of that day, we were able to make a query from that other data center and pull data out of WebSphere that then subsequently had pulled it out of the line of business apps. So to me, that, that you know, really we did it in half a day and we spent half a day telling them what we were gonna do. But that, that's, to me, is one of the, you know, one of the best um, kind of prototyping and hybrid integration stories I've done for a while. Now, you know, we, I mean, I'd, I'm not a WebSphere expert by any means, but what I, what I do know a little bit about is BizTalk and WCF routing service is pretty cool. You know, it can do forwarding of messages, but you've got some limitations. You can get, basically get a message and send it somewhere else. With BizTalk, if you were a BizTalk customer, you've got the option of connecting one of your receive locations, and then you've got this, this big sort of integration engine with pub sub capability and some workflow capability. So you could do some much richer integration patterns off the back of that and hook into your line of business apps and you know kind of a bit like what WebSphere probably did but without having to have that that WCF routing service in front of it. Okay so next one we've got um, service bus messaging and service bus messaging is completely different to everything I've told you about so far so at the minute whether we've talked about a networking technology or we've talked about service bus relay the whole concept being we, we have a client, a destination, we open a connection, send some data over the wire and get something back. And you know, we, we all understand that pretty well, but the difference with service bus messaging is we've suddenly got this ability to decouple the sender and the receiver, and we can put something in the middle. And that might be, might be you know, not needed for some patterns, but for other patterns, it gives you a really powerful platform to be able to do some cool messaging, uh, message exchange patterns. So you could do things like store and forward, publish, subscribe, and a whole bunch of other rich integration patterns. And, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about the patterns there, but there's also the ability to do that asynchronously. And we also get some durable messaging. So your client may be offline for a couple of hours and can pick these messages up later. The um, the other good thing about this one as well, it's quite a good one if you want to like push data outside your organization as well. So maybe BizTalk pushes it up to Service Bus and you can pick it up later on. 
The key benefits of uh, service bus messaging, again, it's really simple. You know, it, if, you, if it's new to you, it might take a little bit of getting used to, but it, it's not that steep a learning curve compared to a lot of technologies. And if you're a BizTalk guy, I'd argue you'd, you'd pick this up in, in no time at all. Um, Cost-wise, it's very low. So we, we've done loads of messaging through Azure Service Bus messaging for a good few years now, and I bet, I bet we've spent barely £10 a month or something like that, you know, we've, and we've done some pretty reasonable volume. Um, the, you know, apart from the patterns, I guess the other constraints are um, you need to be able to talk the right protocol, so most of the other ones are going to be TCP-based connections. Um, this one, you, you know, ideally you, you want to be trying to look at AMQP, but it also supports um, REST or service bus messaging, which is kind of like a native, a native option from Microsoft. Now, a couple of projects that we, we used this on. So this, this was probably, um, probably the most complicated project I've done for, for a while, but actually it was a lot simpler than it might have been 10 years ago or five years ago. And if you imagine a couple of times already, I've talked a little bit about this multiple business scenario. So we've got a business in Miami, we've got a business in the UK, and we've got a business in Denmark, but actually we've got a whole bunch of other businesses as well. And the problem we had was that um, all of our partners kind of, you know, they, they integrate with these businesses as, as like an individual entity. There's no kind of single view across all of them. And that means that any partners we work with, if we do business in more than one country, the cost of working with that partner is a lot higher. So if we can, if we can make that simpler and, you know, make it cheaper for them, we become a more attractive partner to work with. And we, we'll obviously have, you know, more, um, more customers, more profit, et cetera, on the back of that. So the project was all about create a single API, work with multiple businesses, but also can we plug in more businesses? So if we start with a couple, let's add more later, and maybe we, we acquire new businesses next year, we might want to plug them in as well. So doing the API bit's quite easy. You know, we can just stick something in Azure. You know, we, we created a web role, wrote an API that sits in it, and you know, we could put API management in front of it. But as Josh alluded to the other day, that's kind of the easy bit. You know, we, we integration guys know the, the back end of that's where the real hard work is. And not only are we integrating into one business, we've got, you know, th well, I think last time I checked, we had three currently plugged in. Each of those have their own data model and different connectivity pieces. So what we did to create that back end is we put service bus messaging in Azure behind the API, and that gave us this ability to do pub sub based messaging. And then we had, um, in one company, we can have BizTalk, that can connect a service bus. Another company, we've got WebSphere, and they have AMQP capability, so they can connect a service bus. And, uh, excuse me, another company might have um, a much simpler technology, and they could just do it with .NET or something like that. And once we've got it all wired up, we can you know, send some canonical messages down on-premise and let the on-premise stuff deal with their local business um, you know, specific stuff. So how do I convert? a get customer message into whatever I need to do to get a customer. And you might go to one application in one country, two or three in a different one. And that, that was the kind of beauty of sort of doing the pub sub of that. And when, when you think about, you know, I mean, if you think five years ago, that would have been a really difficult project to solve because you'll end up with VPNs all over the place. Where do you host the API? You know, it, it'd just be really difficult. And I think, you know, to me, the, the Azure piece solved the really hard problem in that and let us focus on you know focus on what each business needed without you know without the connectivity and i, th I think if i remember right we had um we had our first prototype of the connectivity plugging into two businesses in like a couple of days you know it was really really quite powerful the next option was service bus message and then you can you can also go the other way so here we've got a scenario where we might use BizTalk to pull sql server and it gets some messages, you know, gets a batch of data, just debatches it, pushes a bunch of messages out to Service Bus, and then we can just let Service Bus pub sub, so multiple subscribers can pick messages up whenever they want to. And, um, you know, there may be other businesses, there may be other applications, and, you know, you've got a lot of choice there. And that really just illustrates that it, it's quite easy to go the other way too. So the next one is BizTalk Adapter Service. And I'm kind of thinking everyone's still here sitting through their breaks. So I'm obviously doing an okay job, I think, which is good. Um, so BizTalk Adapter Service, in my opinion, is one that, you know, I've, I've 
don't think I've ever really come across anyone using it, um, using it in anger. But I know there's, there's a lot of blogware out there about it and, and demos about how to use it. And in my opinion, the easiest way to explain the adapter services is it's a little bit like WCS, sorry, Service Bus Relay, but there's a different level of abstraction. So rather than being able to talk anything that's REST or anything that's WCF, now we've got um, a sort of, we've focused in on just specific types of application. So we've got the, um, the BizTalk adapter pack involved as well. And we're really talking about how do I do a bridge connection to talk to SQL Server or to talk to SAP or whatever the other ones support. And the target use cases are really around connectivity for those specific LOB applications. And you know, I guess the benefits are that it's, you know, it's pretty easy to set up. It's pretty low cost. Um, well, debatable low cost anyway. Um, the, you know, the, and the key constraint is that it needs a BizTalk services subscription. So as, as I say, it's one that's out there, you can use it. I've not come across that many people who have, but if anybody has, I'd love to have a chat maybe offline and, and just find out what you guys are doing with it. Um, to give you an example of how, how you may use it and how we prototype this, we thought about, well, what if I've got a mobile application that wants to call a, an AI bridge in Mavs? And if we wanted that bridge to be able to call down into something like SAP on premise, Basically, what we'd do is we'd go to the, um, to the portal and we'd set up our adapter service. And then you had an agent that you would install on premise and it, it's aware of the, um, of the adapter pack and, and what you know, connectivity you've got. And effectively, once you've joined it all up, your EAI bridge could reach through on premise. You, know, you haven't really had to do any kind of fancy networking or anything like that. And you can you know, pull data out of your, your SAP system. The final one, um, hybrid connections. So this, this is probably um, one of the cooler ones, in my opinion, but it's certainly the newest one that we've had. And, and again, this one's in BizTalk services. So it's, it's a one that you know, we, we should all be at least aware of what it does and where it fits, even if we haven't used it. And if you think in the last um, section, I talked about how BizTalk adapter service was a bit like the relay, but it kind of went to a high level of abstraction to focus on specific applications. This time we've kind of gone the other way and we've went to a lower level of abstraction. So instead of talking WCF and REST, we can actually talk and kind of any protocol we want now. A couple of restrictions on that maybe, but generally it's, it's kind of lower level. And the target use cases are really anything that you want to access that exposes a port that you can connect to is, is really what it's about. So you could connect directly to SQL. You could, you know, in theory, you could probably connect to an MLLP port or something like that. Um, the target scenarios are really about what's things that are hosted in Azure websites and Azure mobile services. There's talk about this potentially being available from Azure VMs, but it's not available yet. So when it is, as a BizTalk guy, that would be something I'd be very strongly interested in because it gives me an easy way to reach down with traditional BizTalk adapters from the cloud to on-premise without having to really make any changes. Um, the, the key benefit, I guess, it's pretty simple to set up um, and it, it's kind of easy to understand as well because, you know, it, it's a bit like Service Bus Relay, it's not that complicated. A um, couple of constraints though are you need a BizTalk services subscription and a knock-on of that is, you know, you might have to think about how much you're going to use it and what the price would be for that. And I think, if I remember right, there's, there's now a, a very cheap or free tier that you can play around with. But you, you, know, you need to just be aware of, of what the costs might be for that. Um, the biggest constraint, in my opinion, though, is that it still only uh, supports websites and mobile services. So if you're not building that stuff, you can't use it. But um, I'd, I'd expect more in the future for us to, to play with. And um, to give you an example of a project where we, we use this, so if you imagine I've got my website on premise in my data center, maybe in my DMZ probably. Um, we've got our Oracle database sitting there and, and we're connecting to that. And it's a very traditional kind of model people would, um, would develop websites with. But my, you know, my C, uh, CTOs kind of said, well, look, I don't want to be hosting this stuff on, on my data center. I need to bring that footprint down. I want you to shift some stuff to the cloud. And this, this could be a good candidate to do that. So what we could do is basically, you know, we're, we're used to it working already. Um, we don't really want to make any changes, but Instead, we shift the website up to Azure Websites. 
And the problem now is it's kind of not in the in the data center anymore. It's outside. How do we, you know, how do we get to that Oracle database? And you know, there's many many different choices we could take. But in this case, we've said right, hybrid connections are the ones. So basically, we'd set up a hybrid connection in the cloud. Again, we'd install an agent on premise that would listen to that stuff we've got in the cloud. And then we'd join the dots up and effectively the website could make an ODP.net call, but we just change the connection string to point to the hybrid connection and it just magically routes through to the, to the back end database. So the key thing here is the only thing that we changed, we didn't change a single line of code, we only changed the connection string and I think that's a really powerful thing because that gives you a good lift and shift model for an application that fits that scenario. Now, you do need to be aware that um, you know, there may be some things that mean might restrict you a little bit. So, for example, if you're using Windows integrated security to talk to SQL, that wouldn't really work in that scenario because you, you wouldn't be able to get the security to work. But with Oracle, we may be using username password in this case, and it, it should just work f perfectly fine. Um, that, that's kind of my lap around the technology. So what I wanted to do after that was really talk a little bit about some of my thoughts. And in Australia, I kind of went through this whole thing about how do you decide which one to choose? Because I think that's probably a, a really important segment. And, and it's something personally I'm really interested in how companies make those decisions. And I always believe that we should, you know, we need to kind of involve people in the decision so everybody's happy with it. But we need to have a leader who who says, right, this, this is what we're going to do and I'm going to make this happen. And I talk a little bit about frameworks we use, but to, in the interest of time today, I need to be a bit careful about how long, how long we cover. So the thing I'd really say to cover this in one slide is read that book, because the framework we used was based on what Richard talks about in that book, and I'm a big believer in that. Um, if you already have an enterprise architecture framework which covers decision-making, use that. Just make sure you use something where... You know, I think if, if I can come along and audit your company and say, why did you do it like that? I'd just love to see somebody pull out a, a little paper where they said, well, we thought about these options. These were the pros and cons, and we picked that one for this reason. If you do that, then at least you've got some you know, justification behind the decision you'd make. That, that would be kind of how I'd um, describe that in one slide. Now, what I wanted to do, that this bit's new. So if you've seen this in Australia before, you probably think, well, I've, I've seen this, but I've put a couple of slides in just to really say, well, this week we've seen some cool biz talk microservices stuff. And actually, I'm telling you so far about what's there now. So I wanted to just throw a couple of ideas out about how what I've just told you might play in a microservices world. And if we think about the options I've talked about, so the key thing is that we're actually in quite a good place. You know, if you, if you want to invest now, in understanding these hybrid technology options and do some cloud stuff. You're actually learning stuff that will still help you when microservices comes along. So I think that's a good thing. And if we think about them specifically, well, you know, the other day we were told how microservices would live in a rebrand of Azure websites. But the key thing, if it's based on the website's technology, they can now connect to an Azure uh, virtual network. And that means express route, site-to-site -site VPN, they're still going to work fine. So you're in a good place there. But also, things like Service Bus, well, you know, and, and I, personally, I think they'll, they'll be really commonly used um, options here, Service Bus, because it's just so easy to set up and, and manage and run. So things like calling from a microservices through a relay or a queue to come on premise, I think that'll be a great scenario that people will use as well. And actually, I'd, I'd expect, you know, if there's any Microsoft guys here, expect you thinking very heavily about using Service Bus between microservices. That would be something I hope I see in the coming months. Um, the ones I've, I've kind of put a little bit of a question mark on, and I, I had a bit of a chat with Guru about this yesterday because I was just really interested in finding out um, what his opinion was as well and making sure I didn't upset him by saying something too controversial. But I think um, the hybrid connectivity and uh, BizTalk adapter services, I've put a bit of a question mark on them. And the reason I've done that is the things we've said this week are there's going to be changes in those areas. But when I had a good chat with, it, with Guru about it, basically the things we've learned this week are that one, MABS 1.0 is production ready. So number one, you can use these right now. And 
when we go to microservices, what I'd expect to see is that these technologies will kind of follow through to microservices as well. And they may change a little bit and be done in a quite, you know, a slightly different way. But the expectation is we'd have a, a clean migration story. So my belief is that if you bet on these, you should be fairly safe, but you just need to, to accept that there might be a little bit of risk that there'll be some change in that area. Um, but I think that, you know, they're so simple to use that you're probably not in a, not in a place where I would, I would be too concerned about that. Now, the, the last little bit I wanted to do was kind of say, well, th this, this was done um, in one of the breaks yesterday, so it, I haven't thought too deeply about it, but I want to just throw an idea out there about, um, here's a solution I built a couple of years ago in BizTalk. How might I change it in a microservices world, and how would hybrid connectivity help me do that? And I just want to throw some ideas out there and see if you guys find that interesting and see if you agree or if you, if you have a different view on it. Um, so the idea was a couple of years ago, we, we built these solutions with BizTalk, and the idea was we had a business where we'd get a whole batch of claims come in from different partners, and they were, they were kind of insurance claims. And we used BizTalk to debatch them, do a bit of stuff, and then load them into our line of business application. And we didn't actually use SAP, but SAP was just the, the first Visio icon I had handy. Um, it, it illustrates the same point, though. And the problem we had with the BizTalk stuff was it worked really well, you know. It was really successful, but the problems, the process for a claim can change quite often. And that becomes a bit of a challenge with BizTalk because we all know BizTalk, it, you know, it's cool, we can do some good stuff with it, but it's not the easiest thing to change if, if you want to change it regularly. And you, you know you can even design to support that, but it's still, you know, it's still quite a big effort to do change in BizTalk. Um, the other challenge was that as the business was, you know, moving through time, we've got new, new channels that kind of come up for claims. So if people want to be able to submit claims via an API, people might want to submit them via mobile devices. But at the same time, we're still going to have these partners who, on, you know, they're not. Um, aggressively change and they'll still be using SFTP in a hundred years time. So I was just doing a bit of thinking yesterday and I thought well actually what would I, what would I do if I had microservices and there's probably a million ways you could do this and I give, if I give us all a bit of paper and said right what would you do we'd all come up with different pictures but just to throw an idea out there what I kind of thought was well the bit that changes all the time the, the kind of core claims processing bit that sounds like a good microservice so maybe I'll put up in the cloud something where I expose an API, I validate a claim, approve a claim, and, and just publish it somewhere. So the, the idea then would be, if, if that changes a lot, it's much easier for me to deploy a new version of a microservice or just you know, support multiple versions of one. But what I might do is I might still have this BizTalk piece that I've always had that does the debatching, but it would just, instead of court, you know, doing it all internally, it would just push out to the microservice and use that, that new logic that I've got in the cloud. And at the end of the microservice, we might just push onto the queue. The next bit would mean that, you know, if I suddenly have um, these new channels that come into play, so I may have a mobile channel or an API channel, the partners could just call my microservice directly, and they could just go through and they could end up on the same queue. And then the last bit about the legacy or the line of business integration, well, BizTalk's great at that, so maybe, maybe I'd just you know, break the stuff up in BizTalk and have BizTalk pull from that queue and load all the messages into SAP or whatever your line of business app was. And, and that was just, just my, you know, early thinking about how I might refactor that. And I kind of felt that the, the benefits I kind of got were, firstly, we isolated what changes frequently and we put that in a container that allows us to do much more agile development. I think that's a really good thing. And I think, that, you know, everything I've seen this week will help me get a lot of benefits for the business there. But then at the same time, I'm thinking, well, BizTalk Server, there's two bits it does really well that I'm not convinced, or, or that's probably a bit controversial, but I think it'll take a bit of time to get those really established in microservices. And I'd expect there'd be a little bit less on the priority list. So I thought, well, if I, if I keep the batch processing in BizTalk Server, probably don't need to change it much and, you know, should work quite well and also that line of business integration bit. But the key one was, well, BizTalk Server plus um, Service Bus, you know, if, we, if we've got these new channels coming in, there's a possible danger that, you know, the good thing is the microservice can auto-scale to really high load, but if I suddenly get my API, 
hit really hard. I don't want to hammer the hell out of SAP or BizTalk. So having the queue on there means I can, I can kind of level that load in the cloud, which is a good thing. You know, it means we protect our on-premise assets and we can just use BizTalk and Service Bus to throttle the load and, and you know, hit SAP at an acceptable rate that'll work for that integration piece. And you know, my, my thought was kind of like, well, there's loads of reuse in there and you know, we, we sort of open up more opportunities for the business. And, and that, was, that was just my early thinking. So you know, I, hope, I hope you guys like what it looks like. Um, you know, and I'd, I'd be interested to see what people think of that. And I wanted to do, just before we wrap up, I want to do one little shout out about um, an article series I wrote recently. Because, you know, again, going back to what I said earlier, most people are saying, I'd like, I like to play in the cloud, but I'm not doing anything real. So um, recently in Hong Kong, I've been doing a lot of work around a biz talk. Well, it's basically, I've called it a, you know, Azure integration platform. And if you imagine we've developed a platform that we've built just in time, hosted in Azure, uses biz talk, uses a bunch of other stuff. And I think there's a, there's a really good story about how we've done that and, and the, the plans we've got. And I thought you guys might find that interesting. So I wanted to do a little bit of a shout out about it. And uh, but after that, thank you very much. And